Welcome class to our uh, session for pre-finals. We are going to discuss on four slides for this session. And this is all about fallopian tube and ovaries. So slide 78, acute salpingitis. Slide 104, that is polycystic ovary. Slide 88, that is cystic teratoma. And slide 82, that's ovarian endometrioid carcinoma. Okay, let's start with acute salpingitis. So, acute salpingitis, uh, this is identified with a cross-section of the fallopian shoe. Okay, and you can see the presence of the outer uh, muscular layer and then you have the plicae, okay, which appear to be thickened in this case. So, in, poly uh, in acute salpingitis, this is seen in... Uh, women suffering uh, from a pelvic inflammatory disease or PID wherein they would complain of abdominal pain when we are uh, having them for consultation. And uh, this is associated with pyogenic organisms. Uh, some of them would be uh, sexually transmitted. We have the chlamydia trachomatis and Neisseria gonorrhea. Okay, so on a higher magnification, you would take note of the thickened plique, and then you would also see the presence of a mixture of inflammatory cells. Okay, so let's try to look at other areas like this case. Okay, so you can see a mixture of inflammatory cells. We have segmenters, okay, here, and then you have histiocytes and lymphocytes. So this is an acute inflammatory process, but you can see that this is, I think this is long-standing already because of the presence of the mononuclear cell infiltrates. Okay, so this is slide 78, acute salpingitis. So next is slide, slide 104, this is polycystic ovary. Okay, so polycystic ovary, uh, is identified with the presence of numerous cysts okay so this is an ovarian stroma this would be a cyst uh, this one is another cyst and then uh, here is another cyst another cyst okay so you have multiple cysts and uh, this is seen in 20 to 30 percent of women Okay, so this is polycystic ovary. And uh, with regard to the cyst, they are lined by granulosa cells. Okay, high power magnification for you to be able to appreciate them. Okay, so these are the granulosa cells. Okay, there. And the granulosa cells here would line the two types of cysts present. We have the cystic follicle and the follicle cyst. Uh, the only difference between the two would be their size. So if we see a cyst that is less than 2 centimeters, we call it a cystic follicle. If we have a cyst that is more than 2 centimeters, we call it as follicle cyst. What about the term polycystic ovarian syndrome? Is it different from a polycystic ovary? Yes. So a polycystic ovarian syndrome would show the presence of multiple cysts like polycystic ovary, but it is an endocrine disorder that would show also hyperandrogenism, the presence of menstrual abnormalities like irregular menstruation or decreased fertility or even chronic anovulation. These patients would also have a metabolic disorder like an insulin resistance like the presence of obesity type 2 diabetes mellitus and premature atherosclerosis so these patients would be would show an increased risk for development of endometrial hyperplasia and carcinoma because of increased free estrone levels okay so next we go to slide 88 okay so Slide 88 has been uh, with us since the neoplasia slide 
And when we talk about mature teratoma, um, we have to remember the four categories of ovarian tumors based on the WHO classification. So what are they? We have the surface epithelial stromal tumor, we have the sex cord stromal tumor, germ cell tumor, and the last would be the metastatic tumor. So where does mature cystic teratoma fall under? It would fall under the germ cell tumor. So a mature teratoma or the term teratoma would mean that it is a tumor derived from the germ cell layers. And when it is, uh, there are three types of teratoma. We have the mature, we have the immature, and then we have the monodermal types. Okay? And so with regards to the mature teratoma, it simply means that this particular benign tumor would be composed of mature looking uh, structures that would be derived from the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm. <clears throat> if we would see most or all of the structures to be derived from the skin, we can call it as a dermoid cyst. Okay? But if it contains other structures like the presence of bone, the presence of cartilage, or other, other structures other than that of the skin, then we call it as a mature teratoma. Okay, so a mature teratoma can be very easy to identify when we look at it in a gross specimen. So when we cut it, it's a unilocular cyst that is filled with hair and sebaceous material. The sebaceous material here would be colored yellow and it is sometimes mushy, okay, or it's a, a little bit oily, okay. So the lining epithelium here is stratified squamous epithelium. And then you can see the presence of fats, the presence of hair follicle. Let's look at the high power magnification. Okay. So you have here the presence of the stratified squamous epithelium, the sebaceous gland. This one is a hair follicle. You have uh, mucus acini. Here is uh, this one is cartilage, sebaceous glands, fats. Okay. So 1% of cases uh, for mature teratoma can have the presence of a malignant lesion. Most common would be squamous cell carcinoma. Okay. So this is mature teratoma. Our last slide for today would be slide 82. This is ovarian endometrioid carcinoma. Okay, so if you remember what I've uh, told you, uh, you have to differentiate this one from the endometrial carcinoma of the endometrium because they are similar. Okay, so under what category uh, does this particular tumor fall under? It would fall under the surface epithelial stromal tumor. Again, surface epithelial stromal tumor. So, when we have the endometrioid uh, defini uh, term, it means that it would show the presence of tubular glands. Okay? It would show the presence of tubular glands that would resemble the endometrial glands. Okay? So, you have tubular glands that would resemble endometrial glands. So, this is an endometrioid adenocarcinoma. So, uh, it can arise in 15 to 20 percent uh, from an endometriotic area, and uh, 15 to 30 percent of endometrioid carcinomas of the ovary would be associated with a synchronous tumor from the endometrium. Okay, so it means that we have an endometrial carcinoma and an ovarian carcinoma both of the same type that is endometrioid uh, the good thing about this one is that it is primary okay both are primary none are metastatic so that would be a good thing but it's a uh, good thing because both are primary but a bad thing because the patient has malignancy okay 
uh, with regards to mutations, it is associated with the similar genetic mutations as what we have learned with endometrial carcinoma of the endometrium. PTEN would be present. Uh, P, uh, P53, those of the PI, uh, PI, uh, uh, PI3K, uh, PAK3 uh, pathway. We have PIK3CA, RID1A, KRAS. Uh, they are mutated in this particular case. And 40% of them are bilateral. So you can see the presence of these glands. We try to look at other areas so that you would appreciate them. Okay. So here you would see the presence of the gland, another gland, another gland. So they are similar to the endometrium or uh, the endometrial carcinoma in the sense that they are both glandular patterns. They also would sometimes uh, show the absence of intervening stroma in between them. Okay, but if you are going to look at other areas, like in this particular portion, okay, what would be absent in this, in this case is the absence of myometrium. Okay, you do not see the smooth muscle fibers that would be present in the endometrial carcinoma of the endometrium. So that is one helpful tip that I can give to you for your practical exam, okay? So again, tubular glands, you think of endometrioid carcinoma. Absence of the, of the smooth muscle fibers, ovarian, okay? But if there's presence of muscle fibers, it's endometrium, okay? So we will st stop with those four slides. Next meeting, we're going to have the rest of the slides for the ovary. Okay, so stay safe and good night.